Iconography is as important to the horror genre as parental issues and stupid teenagers. Be it a recognisable weapon of choice, a mysterious mask, or a particularly duplicitous doll, if you can boil your bloody business down to a marketable, merchandisable image, that's when nightmares become legends. We'll tear your soul apart. As for this ugly mother lover, all they need to strike fear into soldiers, scientists, and civilian bystanders are three modest dots. This reticle is as efficient and ingeniously economical as the series' central conceit. What if we made the most dangerous game, but we gave the bad guy a yonic mouth and a plasma cannon? Alas, the further each subsequent entry has gotten from those elementary origins, the harder it's been to lock onto what made it such a singular hybrid of sci-fi frightener and survivalist thriller. That is, until director Dan Trachenberg, writer Patrick Ason, and producer slash First Nations cultural advisor Jane Myers delivered a searing return to form for the franchise with Prey. A simple, smart, and scary scrap between primal ferocity and thoughtful composure. No, he has us. It's 1719, and Naru, a budding Comanche warrior, sets out to prove her worth through a traditional rite of passage. All the while, an invisible, otherworldly entity stalks the wilderness, looking for a worthy foe. There's an uncomplicated confidence in Prey's structure and screenplay that cuts through the flab of the lesser sequels and hones in on what made Predator, Predator 2, and about two-thirds of Predators work so well. Each takes a heady concept and broaches it with a utilitarian ruggedness that leaves the audience wanting more, but not necessarily needing it. It's only in the bad sequels that the cracks in the Yautja armour start to spread, as the contradictory backstory and expository gibberish kicks in. Which is how we ended up with a tandem rocket sled ride out of an ice pyramid, the Pred alien fiasco, and uh, the revelation that these aliens are here to steal as much autistic DNA as possible before we're wiped out by global warming? <laughs> <You're stupid. laughs> in contrast, Prey hunkers down in the rustic purity of its premise whilst drawing a stark parallel between the hunter and hunted, with both the oppressive and oppressed forces undergoing their respective ritualistic trials to earn respect and ascend the ranks of a hierarchical social structure. You want to hunt something that's hunting you? By using a canonical quirk of this franchise, namely that predators have no interest in killing or claiming trophies from those it doesn't consider a threat, Prey manages to extrapolate a compelling character arc from what has otherwise been a bit of lore, a trait that, up to this point, has mainly functioned as a way to avoid the sight of an intergalactic behemoth desecrating the corpses of unarmed women, children, and elderly people. When Naru is spared a warrior's death at the hands of her adversary, it's not an act of mercy. I didn't think I was a threat. It's a shaming insult that plays into our protagonist's ambitions and insecurities. Who invited you? We won't be gone long enough to need a cook. Naru doesn't prescribe to the rigid gender roles of her people kicking against mansplaining jerks and condescending dismissals to pursue a path of her own choosing. It won't matter how sharp it is if you're too afraid to use it. In a neat little touch, every facet of her combat prowess, 
is a subversion of some tool intended to support the men of her tribe and maintain the status quo. The tomahawk Naru is gifted to chop herbs and roots, her scouting and reconnaissance skills seemingly intended for foraging and farming, and her knowledge of anatomy and combat triage meant to facilitate and care for the male hunters on their return from battle. Why do you want to hunt? Because you all think that I can't. How Naru cements her standing above the patriarchal confines of her clan and the way she defeats her unknowable antagonist are built on the same principles. Utilising the short-sighted dismissal of others as an opportunity to observe, learn, plan, and ultimately obliterate the obstacles ahead of her. You think that I'm not a hunter like you? And I'm not a threat. That is what makes me dangerous. Now, there's a small contingent of extremely strange people out there who think this film about a taloned spaceman on a human safari is somehow bending to the whims of pinko lefty scum and introducing politics into their beloved schlock. This is the worst kind of discrimination, the kind against me. Moving past the entitled dorkiness, unmasked misogyny, and I'm not a racist but weirdness of those sentiments, to put any stock in the accusations that this series has gone woke would require you to literally disregard every single other entry in this filmography. While Prey functions as a rudimentary but respectable attempt to reject gender essentialism, that's not so far off what Predator was doing back in 1987. A satirical slasher takedown of 80s action machismo, in which every brand of gun-toting hyper-masculine Reagan-era trope is shredded to ribbons by a silent, astute adversary to whom their raw strength means nothing. The only way for this totem of shoot-first testosterone to intelligently outmaneuver a more versatile, adaptable opponent is to weaponize the natural world through perspicacity and patience. It's a strategy that's mirrored by Naru in her attempt to dominate a physically and technologically superior opponent. To call Naru some kind of Mary Sue, you would have to purposefully ignore the extended and bountiful scenes of her trying, failing, training, and refining her skills before they're ever successfully put into practice. Yes, Prey features a woman capable of surviving the Predator's attacks, but so does every single one of these movies. As for politics, the first film is made in the shadow of Vietnam and dripping with Cold War nuclear anxieties and the Iran-Contra scandal. The second wallows in the escalating violence of the war on drugs and a pre-millennial Los Angeles pockmarked with unemployment, gang activity and police brutality. Then Predators thumbs its nose up at unconstitutional extradition whilst honing in on PTSD and the thin grey line between mercenaries, military and murderers. Go on. So, when I say Prey is a prequel more than willing to take a hatchet to themes of colonialism, invasion and counterinsurgency, it's as in keeping with this series' tradition as mandibles or muscly handshakes. Dylan! You son of a bitch! This is the American frontier divorced from whitewashed John Wayne nostalgia with the open plains of promised liberty, offering no shelter from the encroaching horrors. The Predator, and even more so the French trappers who enter the picture later on, are exploitative, destructive creatures. From the fields of buffalo wastefully skinned and left to rot, to the massacre and mutilation of these natives all for the sake of vanity and pride, this is shock and awe imperialism. 
It's no mistake that the filmmakers paint both the Predator and the Fur Trappers as kindred spirits of colonialist oppression. Uncaring, culturally unrecognisable entities who both arrive on imposing ships to subjugate and exploit a native populace through technological superiority and a ruthless disregard for humanity. As with any honest examination of how the West was won and where it got us, Prey refuses to assign any valour to those who would seek to dehumanise and defile. It understands that, even when indigenous peoples and minorities are given a sporting chance or level playing field by an occupying force, it's an illusion of parity rather than an honest, honourable engagement. Which leaves insurgency as the last best course of resistance against their would be conquerors. <laughs> By asserting a greater understanding of their environment, guerrilla tactics, and a willingness to use their enemies' weapons against them, Nauru and her kin are able to overcome and vanquish those bent on displacing and destroying their people albeit at the cost of many noble lives. In this regard, Prey can be viewed as a First Nation power fantasy, as Nauru proves herself against patriarchal and colonial systems of oppression. A righteous victory that flies in the repugnant face of historical fact. And yet, as the closing credits play out, the fantasy comes apart. With a final shot of three additional Predator ships cutting through the clouds, we're reminded of the unconscionable atrocities the indigenous Americans are yet to face. The reason Prey works so well is that, by turning the clock back 300 years and stripping away the modern arsenals of adversary and ally alike, it's the first entry since the original to push these films forwards thematically without succumbing to some convoluted mythologising or downright silliness. It doesn't quite achieve the greatness it aspires to, given that there's too much uncanny CGI sheen and they show the Predator far, far too early for my liking, but goddamn does it get closer than most of the other attempts. Oh, and of course a special commendation for one of the greatest dogs in cinema history, which goes to show that dogs make all movies better. <laughs> Yeah, it's got a diverse cast and a woman who defies a lack of agency to survive situations in which more heaving brutes are eviscerated, but so does every one of these films. Just like all the good entries in this franchise, there's a political undercurrent you can either dive into and appreciate, or completely ignore in favour of wall-to-wall -wall badassery and bloodlust. Prey is a talon to the throat triumph that knows this monster inside and out. A standalone prequel that proves straightforward doesn't mean stupid, back to basics isn't the same as regressing, and there's far more than one way to skin this particular beast. Predator 2 is underrated for our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire MD, Becky O, Scared Confusion, and Nicholas Lairevere, and the coolest Predator weapon is the cheese wire net thing for all these amazing folks who support us over on Patreon. So what did you all make of Prey, and where would you rank it amongst the other entries in the series? Make sure to let us know your thoughts down in the comments, click like, subscribe, and share these videos on your social media, and if you're in a position to do so, consider checking out our Patreon at the link in the description below, and checking out our film club and other available perks. As always, thank you for watching, until next time, this is In Frame Out. Thank <laughs> you.